Around 231 BC, King Agron of the Ardii, an Illyrian tribe, died of pleurisy, a condition which, according to ancient sources, was brought on by too much carousing. When he has died, his son Pinion was just an infant, and so his wife, Teata, took control of the Ardii kingdom as the queen regent. Agron had been engaging in a policy of aggressive expansion in the Ionian Sea, and Teata continued that policy. And the Illyrians were known for their pirate fleets, and Teata enthusiastically supported that trade and encouraged her people to raid other nation ships indiscriminately. And it's not a surprise, as RDI piracy became more brazen, that they would come into conflict with a growing power in the Mediterranean, Rome. The war that would eventually become known as the First Illyrian War, and the leader of the Illyrians, Teata, the pirate queen of the RDI, is history that deserves to be remembered. Because after all, don't all great stories involve pirates? For millennia, pirates have ravaged the coastlines of the Mediterranean. The earliest accounts of piracy date to the 14th century BC Amarna letters between Egyptian and Levant kingdoms who complained of incessant raiding by sea. Several centuries later, Pharaoh Ramses the Great would defeat and forcibly settle the Sea Peoples, a still mysterious group of raiders. One of the driving factors in continued piracy was the proliferation of the slave trade. Even legitimate sea traders like the Phoenicians would turn to piracy occasionally, both in war and when the opportunity presented itself. Slaves were a valuable commodity and represented one of the very few opportunities for upward mobility for poor farmers and fishermen. The Illyrians took well to this kind of life. Living on the rocky shores of the Adriatic, farming was often difficult and many coastal tribes spent their time fishing at sea. The temptation to turn pirate and take a piece of the riches from the growing sea trade between Rome and Greece was great indeed. The Illyrians designed a kind of small, fast-moving boat called a limbus, which had no sail but was well suited to prey on treasure-laden ships that hung in the shallow waters close to the shore. The ships carried 50 men in addition to rowers and could quickly catch the slow-moving trade ships, relieve them of their cargo and captured slaves, and then disappear into the tiny rocky inlets of the Adriatic coast. The term Illyrian did not refer to a single homogenized people, but to a group of tribes living in the Balkans. The name appears to have belonged to the first tribe that the Greeks encountered, which was then applied to all the tribes from the same area with similar customs. The Greeks and Romans described the Illyrians as warlike and savage, and that they were strong and always ready for a fight, but slow-witted and heavy drinkers. The Illyrians had a long history of wars with Greek states in Macedonia, but in the 3rd century BC, the Ardii tribe under King Agron grew ambitious. Greek historian Polybius said that Agron possessed the most powerful force, both by land and sea, of any of the kings who had reigned in Illyria before him. Under his leadership, the Ardii would reach their greatest extent, from Nerona in the north to the river Oz in modern-day Albania. He captured the city of Epidamnos, established control over the island of Corfu, and made his general Demetrius the governor of the island of Pharos. But Agron's greatest victory came in 231 BC. Political changes in Epirus caused some of the Acarnanians to secede. They were quickly threatened by the powerful Greek Aetolian League, a group of city-states and tribes in central Greece. The Aetolians were at the height of their prestige after having defeated a Gallic invasion 40 years earlier. Trapped in the city of Median, the Acarnanians requested the help of the king of Macedonia, who in turn paid Agron to relieve the city. Agron sent 5,000 soldiers, the largest army ever assembled by the Illyrians, who landed in secret and faced the Aetolian army. The Aetolians took a good defensive position on a hill, but the Adriae charged it fearlessly. Polybius reported that the Illyrians, whose numbers and close order gave them irresistible weight, quickly routed the Aetolians. The Illyrians then charged down the hill to meet the rest of the Aetolian army and routed them without difficulty. The defenders sailed out from the city, and after killing a great number and becoming masters also of the Aetolians' baggage, the Ardii sailed for home. This unlikely victory caused a sensation in Greece. When Agron heard the news, he was so pleased by the victory that he celebrated to excess and fell into a pleurisy that ended fatally in a few days. In his place, his second wife, Teuta, began ruling as regent instead of her infant stepson. Teuta continued her husband's aggression in the region, possibly again raiding Epidamnos and ordering her own attacks which reached up the Peloponnesian coast. On their return journey from these raids, they attacked Phoenus, one of the most powerful cities in Epirus. She took the city and defeated several Greek attempts to retake it. The Aetolian and Achaean leagues sent a relief force, but the Illyrians released the city in exchange for payment, as they needed to return home to put down a local uprising brought on by Agron's death. 
Phoenix decided afterwards to ally themselves with the Ardrii pirates instead of face them again. After putting down the rebellion, Teata returned to sea to capture Issa, another Greek island. During this time she was supplying pirates of her tribe with letters of mark, identifying them as Ardrii pirates. She was positioning her kingdom to be a serious threat to trade in the region, and the Romans were finally starting to take note. As early as 246 BC, the Romans had been aware of piracy in the Adriatic, and many petitions were brought to the Senate by terrorized traders. The Romans had even settled at Brundisium to help protect the Ionian Gulf. At the time, however, the Romans were in the middle of the First Punic War against the Carthaginians and could not spare anything for pirates. The Punic War had begun between Roman and Carthaginian allies on the island of Sicily. The Romans had established firm control over central Italy and under the Republic were ready to expand. The powerful Roman legions gave them an advantage on land and allowed them to win a bruising victory against the Carthaginians at Agrigentum, ensuring their control over Sicily. The Carthaginians decided that their best strategy was to avoid land battles and fight instead at sea, where their large navy held a decided advantage over the navy-less Romans. To rectify this, the Romans began an ambitious shipbuilding project and built over a hundred ships in only a few months. The Roman crews, however, were unskilled at sea. They lost 17 ships almost without a fight in their first encounter with the Carthaginian navy. The Romans turned to ingenuity to make up for their inexperience and designed a kind of boarding ramp with a sharp beak at one end called a corvus. The board could be dropped on enemy ships to secure them in place, allowing the Roman infantry to use their fighting skills. When the war began, the Romans had no navy to speak of, but by the end they had won a string of naval victories that humiliated the Carthaginians and gave Rome greater control over the Mediterranean. The sea they would come to call Mare Nostrum, meaning Our Sea. When the First Punic War ended in 241 BC, the Romans enjoyed a newfound naval supremacy and had the time and resources to deal with such irritations as pirates. Polybius describes the next series of events, but his histories are biased against the Illyrians and Queen Teata, who he describes as short-sighted and foolish. Two Roman diplomats met Teata while she was besieging Issa and were granted an audience. The Romans presented their complaints about Ardii piracy, demanded that she order to cease and that she pay reparations for lost crew and cargo. In return, Teata told them that Illyrians considered piracy a lawful trade, and that it was contrary to the custom of the Illyrian kings to hinder their subjects from winning booty from the sea. She promised that royal ships would not bother the Romans, but she could not interfere with the private wrongs of individual pirates. Perhaps inadvisably, one of the diplomats replied that the Romans have an admirable custom, which is to punish publicly the doers of private wrongs, and that she should amend the laws if she didn't want to escalate the conflict. Teata did not take kindly to the insult, and perhaps foolishly ordered the diplomat assassinated on his trip back to Rome. One of the ambassadors was killed, the other captured. And while there is some evidence that suggests that the death of the diplomat at the hands of pirates was only a coincidence, whatever Teata's real words and intentions, her refusal to end piracy injured Roman pride. Rome began planning to send an army over the Adriatic for the first time in their history. Before that force could arrive, however, Teata outfitted another fleet to sail in the spring of 229. This fleet continued Teta's aggressive campaign against the Greeks. They besieged the Greek city of Corsira on the island of Corfu. The Corsirians turned to the Greeks, who sent a fleet to relieve the city. Reinforced by ships from Arcanania, the Illyrians met the Greeks off the island of Paxos. The Illyrian strategy was to last four of their ships together, presenting appealing targets for boarding. Once the Greek ships had gotten entangled with the formation, the Illyrians boarded the Greek ships and captured them. They captured four ships this way and sank another. The remaining Greek ships fled the battle. This victory demoralized the Corsirians, who came to term with the Illyrians. Teata put Demetrius of Pharos, who had probably commanded the fleet at Paxos, in charge of the city. The Illyrians moved on to besiege Epidamnos. The Romans were at this point already under sail to punish Teata and end the threat of piracy. With the capture of Corfu, the Illyrians now threatened trade more than ever. The Roman consul sailed to Corsira, where he already knew the city had surrendered. He was, however, in contact with Demetrius, who had double-crossed the queen and conspired with the Romans to give up the city without a fight. The city was quickly made a Roman protectorate. The second consul crossed to the city of Apollonia with a force of 20,000 infantry and 2,000 cavalry. The two Roman forces met and moved on Epidamnos, but by now the Illyrians had gotten wind of the assault and had dispersed. Despite her earlier conflict with the Roman diplomats, Teta seemed to be caught completely off guard by the Roman invasion and the defection of her general. Rome took Epidamnus as a protectorate and marched inland to accept the surrender of several other Illyrian tribes. 
The Romans relieved the still ongoing siege of Issa, and the remaining Illyrian ships fled to cities on the coast, while the Romans proceeded to raid Illyrian towns. Teata herself fed to Ryzen, the base of her fleet. The Romans began to meet stiffer resistance in the area and decided that they had done enough and called back their army. They left one consul and 40 ships to protect the islands and cities now under Roman protection and put Demetrius in charge of much of the Ardriae kingdom as a Roman client. This gave the Romans their first toehold on the Greek peninsula. Teata sent emissaries to the Romans in 228 and concluded a treaty which restricted her movement, stripped the Ardii of most of their kingdom, and made them promise not to sail south with more than two ships, which must be unarmed. She was made to pay an annual tribute and acknowledge the supremacy of Rome. Legend in Modern Ryzen says that Teata, humiliated and defeated, stepped down from the throne and shortly after threw herself from a mountain peak nearby. After her death, Demetrius married Agron's first wife, Try Teata to legitimize his control over the former Ardrei kingdom. He would go on to rebel against the Romans unsuccessfully several years later, before the Illyrians faced a final defeat in a third war against the Romans. Teata has often been called a pirate queen, although she wasn't actually a pirate herself. Still, her people had a deep culture of piracy that she enthusiastically supported. That her successful reign came to an ignominious end should really be seen in the context of the rise of Rome. Over the next couple of centuries, Rome would come to dominate the entire Mediterranean, so their defeat of a single, relatively small pirate kingdom is not a surprise. Under Roman rule, the Mediterranean Sea would become relatively safe for traders, and it really wasn't until the collapse of the empire centuries later that we returned to the lawlessness and piracy in the Mediterranean. Teata and the Ardii had found a golden age of piracy in the splintered world of 3rd century BC Greek states. But the sea that they once sailed so freely was now under the control of a powerful governor, Rome. And for a while, at least, the time of pirates came to an end. The Ionian Sea is still full of history, but no longer full of Valyrian pirates. And you can tour the Ionian Sea with me, the history guy. Take a cruise of the Ionian Sea from Athens to Venice with me and my lovely wife and co-author of the history guy. All the information is available in the link in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the history guy. Short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.